So I was asked if I'm a podium speaker or if I'm a walker. And I don't know which I am, so I'm just going to hold the mic just in case I decide to do one or the other. I want to talk to you guys today about your purpose. I believe that God has uniquely designed each and every one of you for a specific purpose. But so many of us never end up fulfilling that purpose. And I ask the question, why? Why is it that we could have a specific purpose and yet not pursue it? Well, I'm going to tell you a story about this donkey. And this donkey fell into this well, and it was a deep, dry well. And he was owned by this old farmer, and he had been the faithful donkey of a farmer. And the farmer decided he was going to do whatever he could to get that donkey up out of the well. So he got ropes, and he tried ladders, and he tried to hoist him out of the well, but no matter what he did, he could not get the donkey out of the well. So he decided that there was nothing else to be done but to fill in the well, because by doing this, he could kill two birds with one stone. He could fill in the empty well that was no longer useful, and he could also put the donkey out of his misery. So he calls all of his friends, and they bring their shovels, and they begin to dig and dump dirt onto the donkey's back. And the donkey feels this funny thing fall on his back, and he kind of shakes it off, and he stomps on it. And then he looks up, and he realizes, oh, no, they're burying me alive. So he starts kicking and braying and kicking and braying, until finally he realizes that his situation is helpless. So he kind of settles down in his hopelessness. And when he settles down, he finally gets this great idea. If he keeps shaking the dust off his back, then they can't bury him. So every time they dump some dirt on his back, he shakes it off and he steps up. And they dump still more dirt on his back, and he shakes it off and steps up. And over and over he does this until finally he realizes that he's at the level of the well. And he decides that there's nothing else to be done but to hold his head up high, to step over the edge of the well, and walk out into his freedom. Like the donkey in the story, we have all been through or will go through circumstances in our lives that threaten to bury us. And we have a choice. We can give up. We can lose hope. We can just fall down underneath the weight of our circumstances and become victims. Or, like the donkey in my story, we can step up. We can choose to become victors over our circumstances. So again, I ask, ask you, what keeps us from shaking off the dust and stepping up in our lives? And I would propose to you that the answer to that is fear. We all have different kinds of fears in our lives. There are many things and, that cause us to fear, and there are many ways that we express our fear. But ultimately, I believe there are three main fear areas that keep us from pursuing our purpose in life. And those are the fear of unworthiness, the fear of rejection, and the fear of failure. If we're going to fulfill our purpose, we've got to acknowledge these fears in our lives, and we have to learn to overcome them. So the fear of unworthiness asks the question, do I think I'm good enough? It's based in insecurity, and it's usually the result of some kind of catastrophic event that happened in our lives. I'm going to share with you another story, and this one's about an eagle that thought he was a chicken. So what happened is, there is this old farmer and his son, and they decide to go on a hike one day. And they go up to the top of this peak where they see, out on the ledge, there is an eagle's nest. And the mother eagle has flown off for the day, but the eggs are sitting there in the nest. So the boy decides to take one of those eggs and he sticks it in his pocket. Even though he knows he shouldn't take it, he takes it back to the farm with him. And he doesn't know what to do with it at that point in time, so he sticks it into the chicken coop. And the mother chicken takes care of the egg and then it hatches and out comes the eagle. And they treat the eagle just like he's one of them. So the eagle lives among the chickens, he pecks like the chickens, and he acts just like the chickens. Well, one day a naturalist drives by the farm and he sees this crazy sight. So he pulls over to the side of the road and he starts talking to the farmer and he asks, what is that eagle doing in the chicken coop? And the farmer tells him, that's no eagle, that's a chicken. And the naturalist tells him, I will prove to you that that is in fact an eagle. So he takes the eagle and perches him on his arm and he whispers into his ear, And the eagle, being very uncomfortable by the situation, jumps off of the naturalist's arm, back into the chicken coop, and begins pecking at the ground. 
So then he decides, well, I just need to get him up higher. So he takes him up to the top of the barn. And once again, he perches him on his arm and he whispers into his ear, thou art an eagle, fly. And again, the eagle being very nervous by the situation draws back, he does not spread his wings. And the old farmer says, I told you he was just a chicken. And the naturalist says, give me one more chance. I'm gonna come back tomorrow and I'm gonna to prove to you that he is in fact an eagle. So the next day he comes back and they drive up to a tall mountain peak. And on the mountain peak, once again, he purchases, on, purchases the eagle on his arm. And as he lifts the eagle out, the eagle begins to feel the breeze coming off of the mountain and it begins to fill up under his wings. And he looks up into the sun for the first time and he sees the vast greatness of the sky. And again, the naturalist whispers in his ear, thou art an eagle, fly. And this time, the eagle spreads his wings, at first timidly, but then courageously, and he takes to flight, and he flies off into the sunset, never again to wallow among the chickens. My fear of unworthiness began when I was in kindergarten. Oreo, zebra, half-breed. That's what they called me, because my mother was white and my father was black. And the message that I received from that was unworthy, not good enough. You don't look like us, your skin is not the same color as ours, so you're not good enough. And that began in me this nagging fear that I would never measure up, that I would never amount to anything. And I remember my first day of kindergarten going home and sitting in my mom's big easy chair and just crying and telling her, Mom, I don't want to go back to school because the kids make fun of me because of the color of my skin. I don't want to be a part of that. And I remember distinctly my mom asking me the question, Christina, do you love your father? And I said, of course I love my dad, Mom. She said, are you proud of your dad? And I said, yes, of course I am. And she said, then you need to be proud of who you are because who you are and who your father is, is part of you. And you need to embrace that and stop listening to those lies. Do you struggle with feelings of not being good enough? Did something happen in your life to cause you to feel unworthy? Perhaps it was some type of abuse, a parent who walked out on you or abandoned you, or unending criticism from peers who you're trying to gain their acceptance. Well, whatever the cause, when we doubt our identity, when we doubt our worth, we're like that eagle that forgot that he was of the most majestic of birds. When we wallow in the mire and we peck at the ground, we forget to look up and to see all that we could become. In my life, I began to overcome my feelings of unworthiness when I met Jesus. Through my relationship with God, I learned that I was loved I learned that I was cared about and I learned that I was good enough. And through that, my message became worthy. I was able to shake off that dust. I was able to shake off those negative messages from others that told me that I wasn't good enough and step up toward the truth. So how do we overcome our fear of unworthiness? We need to find out who we are and what makes us worthwhile. We need to find out what we have to offer ourselves and to others and we need to focus on the truth. But there's another fear in our lives that keeps us from shaking off the dust and up toward our purpose. It threatens to keep us from ultimately what we were destined to do, and that's the fear of rejection. And the fear of rejection asks the question, do others think I'm good enough? When we concern ourselves with what others think, then we will try to modify our behavior continuously to try to meet and to please others and to find out what they want us to be. And eventually through that process, we lose our sense of self. We forget who we are. So there's this story about this man and his son and they decide to go into town to the market. And so the man loads up his donkey and he puts his son on the donkey and they begin to ride into town. Well, as they pass this first group of people, the first group of people look at the son on the donkey while the dad is pulling uh, the donkey along, and they say, look at that disrespectful son. How could he let his elder pull the, 
pull the donkey while he just sits atop and rides. So the son, being very uncomfortable by their comments, gets off the donkey, and the father gets on the donkey and begins to ride. And as they continue to ride, they pass another group of people, and the next group of people look at the man riding on the donkey while the son's pulling, and they say, look at that man, that is child abuse. He is sitting atop there so lazily riding on the donkey while his son pulls the donkey along. So now the father feels uncomfortable, so he decides to bring the son up on the donkey with him, and now they're both riding. Well, then they pass a third group of people, and the third group of people looks at them and says, look at those people. How could they do that to the donkey? They have loaded that donkey under such a great burden. That is just animal abuse. They ought to be reported. So now the father and the son are just exasperated. They don't know what else to do. So they both get off the donkey, and as they are riding in town to the market, the man and his son are seen carrying the donkey. <laughs> and now the group of people that are in town look at them and say, has anybody ever seen such a ridiculous sight as people carrying a donkey? And this story just illustrates that if you spend your life trying to please other people, you will end up pleasing no one, and especially not yourself. And like the man and, and, this, and his son in this story, in the end, you may find out that you look and feel quite ridiculous. When you forget who you are, you can't fulfill your purpose. Well, when I was in seventh grade, I joined the basketball team, and I determined that I was going to be the best basketball player I could be. I worked really hard, I got up early every day, and I would walk the mile and a half to school so I could get there before school and get on the basketball court and practice free throws because I did not want to be the person who missed a free throw in a game. And I worked harder and harder and harder, and I ended up being a starting point guard that year. And I had a great year, our team had a great year, and I ended up at the end of the year becoming the best defensive player of the year. And I thought that my success in basketball would gain me more acceptance among my peers, but it didn't. I thought that through my efforts and through the performance that I did on the basketball court that they would appreciate me more and see my worth and want to get to know me better, but they didn't. They still made me feel like I was invisible. And to make things work, worse, in eighth grade, we got a new coach. And this new coach didn't care that I had been the best defensive player. She didn't care that I worked really hard and that I performed well for the team. What she cared about, or at least what it seemed to me that she cared about, was how popular I was among my peers, and I wasn't. So in eighth grade, in spite of my hard work and in spite of the effort that I put forward, I sat the bench. So I went from best defensive player seventh grade to bench warmer eighth grade. And the message that I received from that was, it doesn't matter what you do, we don't think you're good enough. So why was I rejected? Was that something inside of me? Did I need something to change so that I could be more accepted by them? The fact is, is that I could have changed myself a million times over to please other people, and it still wouldn't have been good enough because it wasn't something in me that was lacking, it was something in them. But fortunately, I chose to hear different voices. I heard the voices of my mother and father who were always encouraging me and always telling me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. They did not set limitations on me. They always encouraged me to set my goals high and to strive to achieve them. In fact, they expected me to achieve them. Let me share you, uh, with you another example, and this one's from the life of Dr. Ben Carson. Now, I don't know how many of you know who Dr. Ben Carson is, but I will explain to you who he is through um, sharing you, with you a little bit of his story. So his father left him when he was very young, and this was his first rejection. And the pain of his father leaving him gave him this great sense of shame. Even though it wasn't his fault, he felt like somehow it was his fault. And so he felt defeated. Now, his mother worked very hard to support him and told him that he could be, she said, Benny, you can be whatever you want to be. Benny, you're smart. You can do this. But in spite of her encouragement to him, he still struggled in school. Dumbest kid in class. That's what they called him, the dumbest kid in class. He was regularly humiliated by his classmates because he was at the bottom. And because he wasn't considered smart enough by his peers, he was totally rejected. 
And this is how he describes his experience in his book called Gifted Hands. He said, being at the bottom of class hurt enough by itself, but the teasing and the taunting from the other kids made me feel worse. Sitting stiffly at my desk, I acted as if I didn't hear them. I wanted them to think I didn't care what they said, but I did care. So Dr. Ben Carson began to believe this lie that black kids were not and could not be as smart as white kids. So how did this rejected black kid, dumbest kid in the class, rise to become a neurosurgeon? In fact, he became the first neurosurgeon to be able to separate Siamese twins that were joined at the head successfully. He has become a gifted author and speaker. He spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast when President Bush was in office and in fact may even become a 2016 presidential candidate. How did a man who was called the dumbest kid in class rise to that? What helped Dr. Ben Carson rise to his purpose is the same thing that helped me. We had people in our lives who did believe in us. We had people who set no limitations on us. They expected great things from us. And we focused on those voices that accepted us, those voices that told us that we could do it. And that truth came from both God and from our mothers. By embracing those true messages and rejecting the false ones, we were able to shake off the dust and step up. Now, I don't know what, what you're dealing with today. I don't know your background. Perhaps you don't have that kind of support from a mother or father. Perhaps you aren't receiving that kind of encouragement for them. And maybe they're even the ones that are heaping the insults on you and the ones that are tearing you down. I can't begin to imagine what struggles you guys have been through. But the truth is, there will always be people in your life who are going to try to hold you down. There will always be people in your life who are going to celebrate your suffering. And there are always people in your life who don't want you to realize how talented you are, how gifted you are, how blessed. And as long as you believe that lie, you're just going to allow them to continue to heap the dirt on your back, to heap the dirt, and you'll eventually get buried underneath that. And you won't thrive. So instead of listening to those negative messages, I want you to find that one person in your life who's speaking the positive encouragement and positive truth over your life. Perhaps it is a parent for you. Perhaps it's a teacher, a counselor, a friend. Find that person. And if you don't have that person in your life, then listen to what the Bible says about you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique. You were designed for a purpose. So we have the fear of unworthiness and we have the fear of rejection. But there's another fear, the fear of failure that keeps us from shaking off the dust and, and stepping up in our lives. What if I attempt to fulfill my purpose and I fail? What if I'm setting my goals too high? What if I'm not smart enough? What if I'm really not good enough? So the fear of failure asks, what if I'm really not good enough? What if I really can't do this? Well, there was this ant, and he was running to and fro, and he was just gathering food and enjoying the beautiful, day, the beautiful sunshine for that day. And he comes across this cocoon. And the cocoon is just wrapped up tight, and he looks at that cocoon, and he sees it wrapped up tight, and it's just barely wiggling its tail. And he says... That poor, pitiful creature, he's just locked up and imprisoned in there, and he can't move to and fro like me or run to the tops of the trees or go to the depths of the earth like I can. What a pitiful existence to have. And the creature inside the cocoon didn't say a word. She just held her peace. Well, a few days later, the ant passed by that cocoon again, and it had opened, and there was no longer anything in it. And he looked up wondering to himself, I wonder what happened to that poor pitiful creature that was inside of that cocoon. And just then he begins to feel the shade come over him and he feels this flapping breeze coming from the wings of a butterfly. As he looks up and sees the butterfly, he marvels at it. And the butterfly says to him, I am the poor pitiful creature that you spoke of. And this is what I've become. 
And I'm more than happy to listen to you talk about and boast about your greatness of being able to run to and fro and to go to the tops of the trees or to the depths of the earth if you can make me listen. And with that, she flapped her wings and departed into the sunset. So in this story, it appeared that the caterpillar who was stuck in the cocoon would never be more than a prisoner. The caterpillar could have listened to the ant, looked at her situation, and decided it isn't worth trying to break free. I will never be more than out of this cocoon and I can't fly. What if I don't succeed? She could have said that, given up, and just lain down and stayed in that cocoon and never done anything else with her life. But that wasn't her attitude. Instead, she was quiet, she was patient, and she believed in that which she couldn't see. She believed that she was destined for greatness. She believed that she could fly. And so she spread her wings and broke free from that cocoon and did what she was proposed to do. Well, it wasn't until high school that women were given the opportunity to fly fighter aircraft. Before the first Iraq war, it was thought that women were neither capable of nor should they be allowed to go into combat. And they certainly were not expected to be able to fly on the front lines. Well, then during the Persian Gulf War, women went in in so many different capacities and they were so impressive that the arguments against women flying and being in combat could no longer hold water. They couldn't stand up. So that's when they began to send women to fly fighter aircraft and to go to fighter training. And that was in 1993, and I was a senior in high school. So in high school, I didn't even know about these accomplishments of these women. I didn't know what they had done, and I didn't even know that that was going to open the doors for my future, that what they had done and their accomplishments were paving the way for me. Then in college, I joined the Air Force ROTC, and at the time, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I was studying psychology pre-med, and my plan was to go into the Air Force and be a doctor. Then in my junior year, my commander pulled me into his office and asked me why I hadn't put in my application for pilot training. I told him, sir, I don't think I could do that. And I said, don't you need a technical degree? I'm a psychology major, and uh, I thought you needed an engineering degree or uh, mathematics or something very technical. And, he said, no, you just need to graduate, get that degree. I said, okay, that answers that objection. I said, well, what about my test scores? Um, there's a test that we take when we go into the ROTC, and my tests in the pilot nav uh, category were very low. I had no flying, no aviation experience. Um, I had no idea what it entailed, and I didn't even understand the little mazes that they wanted me to follow. I didn't understand how that was all supposed to work out and that there was actually a right answer. Um, so he just said, take the test again. So I'm like, great, I'm not a very good test taker. So um, I said, okay. I said, sir, I'm gonna pray about this. And I spent two weeks praying about it. And then at the end of that two weeks, I had a dream. And in that dream, I saw myself flying F-16s. And I knew at that time that that was what God had proposed for me to do. And I was scared to death <laughs> because I didn't know if I was equipped to do that. I didn't know if I had the capacity to do that, even though I felt like that was what God had given me to do. But what I discovered is through the process of going through training, that certain people, and people call it chance, I call it God, certain people just lined up in my path and they helped me along. And there was a girl in pilot training who was an aerospace engineering major, and she just helped me with some of that stuff to, to get caught up on, on the things that I needed to know. And little by little, I realized that within me was the capacity to do and fulfill my purpose. So that's how I ended up becoming a pilot. Just like I discovered that it was my purpose to fly and to teach others to fly, God has uniquely designed each and every one of you in this room for a purpose. And your purpose may not look just like mine, and that's okay. It may not look like the person who's sitting next to you. In fact, your purpose may not even be like anything that you've even thought of yet, and that's okay. But whatever your purpose is, this is what I want to challenge you with today. 
Do not let the fear of unworthiness, the fear of rejection, or the fear of failure stand in the way of you fulfilling your purpose. Instead, believe this truth. You are worthy. You are created. You were gifted for the purpose that you were called for. You have what it takes to accomplish your goals, and it's deep within you. You may not know it yet, but you just have to draw it out. So shake off that dust, shake off the negativity, shake off the lies, shake off that belief that you can't be great or that you can't accomplish your goals. Don't let that hold you down and bury you and step up. Step up out of the well, walk out of that pit, hold your head high like the eagle and the butterfly and soar off to your dreams. Thank you.